So next, I want to talk about another model for group therapy. And this comes from Irving Yellum, uh, who uh, is one of the most popular group therapists alive, perhaps. And he wrote the famous text, co-authored the famous textbook uh, on group psychotherapy. And Yellum and his co-author, Mullen Lezik, outline 11 therapeutic factors that emerge within group work. And so these therapeutic factors are, according to, to Yellum and Lezik, these are the central organizing principles and the crucial aspects of the process of change in group therapy. So these therapeutic factors are particularly important. They're essential in group work. So the 11 therapeutic factors are the installation of hope. So this is pretty self-explanatory, but when we're facilitating groups, we need to, we need to cultivate a sense of hope. Uh, we need to help group members feel like participating in the group is going to be worthwhile, that they might get what they signed up for, that their goals, their hopes uh, might be fulfilled through the group process. Uh, we need to help them feel like there's a, a reason for continuing to live, perhaps, and that there's meaning and purpose in their experience and in the group. So uh, we need to instill in them a sense of hope. Sometimes we do this through our, our own sense of confidence in our approach or in our group. Many times this happens in the mutual aid dynamics, in the interaction of group members, that when a group member sees another group member start to change or find new ways of addressing their issues, it instills a sense of hope for other group members that maybe I could do that too. The second therapeutic factor is a sense of universality. And so this has to do with uh, that larger picture, that larger perspective, universal perspective, uh, a sense of the group as a whole phenomenon, that I'm, my experience is not isolated. I'm not the only one that's experienced something like this or that's struggling with this issue, but that there's others and I'm not alone. And so, uh, this is particularly important when we're talking about trauma, because it can often feel like nobody could possibly understand, or nobody's gone through what I've gone through. So the second therapeutic factor, universality, helps to normalize the experience within the group. And it gives group members a broader collective perspective, helps them realize that they're not alone. The third therapeutic factor has to do with the imparting of information. And so this is just like it sounds, the sharing of experience, the sharing of knowledge, the sharing of coping skills, psychoeducation provided by the group facilitator, that there's a richness that happens in groups that doesn't happen in the same way in one-to-one -one settings, in that there's so much information that everybody brings to the group, including all the participants, and that there's a richness in the imparting and sharing of that information with others. The fourth therapeutic factor is articulated as a sense of altruism. So this is that goodwill towards others within the group, similar to uh, what we were describing earlier as mutual aid or peer support, that when groups are cohesive and when groups are really tapped into their therapeutic potential, there's a natural sense of altruism within the group that group members want to help their peers and want to help contribute to the effectiveness and the meaningfulness, the, the uh, kind of fulfillment, the success of the group. There's a natural sense of altruism that emerges within the group, a optimism, perhaps. The fifth of the therapeutic factors is called the corrective capitulation of the primary family group. So this basically just highlights how we all come from families and in our early childhood, we develop different attachment styles based on our, our relationships to our family members, that our family is, is the very first group that we're a part of. Even if we experience trauma, abandonment, rejection, neglect from our primary family group, it still has an, a lasting impact on us as our first group experience. Uh, a family is a group. And so our experience early on in life with our family is our first, our first long-term ongoing 
perhaps group experience. And oftentimes, the many of the sources or underlying fueling factors of our problems in adulthood can be traced back to problems we experienced in our early family. Uh, so the group experience in the here and now offers group members the opportunity to renegotiate the impact or the imprint of their early family group experiences. So we call this corrective emotional experiences. So, uh, for example, if somebody experienced uh, in their early family growing up, they were never listened to, or they didn't feel like their emotions were important or validated by others in the group. They were told to get over it, or uh, don't cry, or don't talk about you know difficult things. You know whether that was said explicitly or or said implicitly through behavior. When they come to a therapy group, there's an opportunity for this to be renegotiated through a corrective experience, where the group leader and the other group members really give this group member permission to talk about it, to be listened to while they're expressing emotions, to validate their feelings and their experiences, to let them know that uh, it's okay to have feelings and that their opinions, their experiences, their sharing is important and valid. And of course, there's lots of different ways that we can uh, tap into this fifth therapeutic factor, the correct recapitulation of the primary family group. It's going to be different for each person, and it'll probably emerge differently depending on the nature of the group and the the primary focus of the group. The sixth therapeutic factor is the development of socializing techniques. So this has to do with uh, really helping group members learn new social skills, essentially. Uh, that a group is a social setting and that within the group, there's going to be social interactions. And so within the group process, we get to develop and refine all of our social skills. You know, how well do we initiate conversation? How well do we approach someone that we don't know? How are we about asking questions and getting to know someone someone new? Uh, we get to develop skills around offering support, emotional validation to others, taking healthy social risks with others, learning how to set boundaries with others, making eye contact, and maybe even healthy uh, physical contact with others. This is all part of development of socializing techniques. The seventh therapeutic factor is about imitative behavior or um, kind of using role models within the group to uh, help us practice or demonstrate uh, behaviors that we might want to imitate, that we might want to replicate in our own role repertoire in our own uh, social skills repertoire. So someone might come to a group and really struggle with setting boundaries. So somebody might come to a group uh, really struggling with setting boundaries, have an opportunity to see the group facilitator set boundaries throughout each group session, and they might get to see other group members set boundaries with a facilitator or set boundaries with other group members. And in doing so, they might get to uh, to see and observe and then imitate some of these boundary setting behaviors. And so uh, this is what, what we mean when we talk about imitative behavior within the group, the seventh therapeutic factor. The eighth factor is called interpersonal learning. And so this is kind of similar to the sixth and seventh in that it's focused on the learning that emerges within a social context that uh, as humans, our brains are really wired for social learning, for interpersonal learning, and that we, we learn best in groups and in relationships. And so because the group is a interpersonal setting, the interpersonal learning that can take place within groups is, is really dynamic and maybe one of the, the main reasons that groups are so effective. Of course, we can cultivate a sense of interpersonal learning in one-to-one -one settings, but that only can take place between the therapist and the client. Whereas in a group setting, there's just far more potentials and opportunities for interpersonal learning that we get to learn from others in the group. We get to learn from the entire group experience. 
The ninth therapeutic factor is about group cohesion or group cohesiveness. So there's a ton of new research coming out about group cohesion and really showing it to be one of the most, if not the most important uh, factor of successful therapy groups. Group cohesion describes the connectedness, the kind of glue that holds the group together, that uh, solidifies into a collective bond, an alliance between all the group members. So in one-on-one therapy, the therapeutic relationship, the therapeutic alliance, is often described as the most important aspect uh, that contributes to the effectiveness of one-to-one therapy. And so in group work, group cohesiveness is, is that. It's the most important aspect. The group cohesion has a determining influence on each individual within the group, for positive or for negative. The 11th therapeutic factor is about catharsis. And so uh, this has to do with the, uh, the release of emotions, the sharing of, of feelings between group members and during the group process. Uh, later on in this video, we'll talk about different types of catharsis from a psychodramatic and Moranian perspective. Uh, there's a ton of different types of catharsis. Usually when we're talking about catharsis, we're talking about an abreactive catharsis. And this is the expression of emotions, oftentimes accompanied by crying or tears or anger, an anger release of some sort, or perhaps laughing or other physical sensations. So catharsis is often part of the healing process. Uh, it's important that we don't overemphasis catharsis. I think there's a uh, distorted beliefs in the therapy world that catharsis by itself is healing when it's not. Uh, often is part of the healing process, but needs to be followed up with some sort of cognitive learning or integration. So catharsis is the 10th therapeutic factor. And then the final therapeutic factor outlined by Yalom is about different existential components. And so uh, Yalom being an existential uh, therapist really emphasizes the various layers of, of existentialism within the healing process and within groups. And this might include uh, discussions about life and death. This might include um, cultivating a sense of meaning purpose in life, uh, the time and, and uh, dreams and goals, that there's all different types of existential factors that show up in our work, perhaps in, in every therapy group and every therapy session, and especially when we're working with trauma. Trauma can often uh, lead us to a sense of existential crisis really turns our life and our worldview upside down. So when we're doing uh, group work, the 11th therapeutic factor has to do with addressing and even cultivating, making sense of all these different existential factors. So these are the 11 therapeutic factors. The installation of hope, a sense of universality, imparting of information, a sense of altruism, the corrective recapitulation of the primary family group, the development of socializing techniques, imitation behavior, interpersonal learning, group cohesiveness, catharsis, and existential factors. So in uh, some of the, the other publications about these therapeutic factors, many people have highlighted how these therapeutic factors are specifically important and helpful for trauma survivors. These 11 therapeutic factors help to combat the sense of shame and isolation that often results after traumatic experiences. These therapeutic factors really help us challenge the negative beliefs, distorted beliefs about ourselves, about others, about relationships, and about the world that often result after trauma. These therapeutic factors promote a sense of support and trust between group members, whereas trauma often disrupts one's ability to trust or to be in, in supportive relationships. The therapeutic factors can, by themselves, really help an individual and a group manage different PTSD symptoms, a sense of avoidance, symptoms related to hyperarousal, 
symptoms related to intrusions or re-experiencing trauma, and symptoms related to negative beliefs and negative feelings. The development of these 11 therapeutic factors within a group setting really helps to, just in an organic way, validate the traumatic experiences that somebody may have gone through. They help to develop a new trauma recovery narrative for the group as a whole, and also for each individual within the group in a really safe way. These therapeutic factors help to facilitate the healthy expression of emotion and help to promote a new sense of identity in trauma recovery or in post-traumatic growth, a new and reintegration of the traumatic experience into our sense of self. These therapeutic factors help mobilize all the various strengths and resources within the group, within the individual, and in doing so, help uh, replenish the sense of depleted inner resources or inner strengths that one might feel after a traumatic experience. And so these 11 therapeutic factors are really powerful, meaningful for trauma survivors, even though the therapeutic factors were not developed specifically focused on trauma-informed or trauma-focused group work. They were developed more in a broader group therapy context. And even though these 11 therapeutic factors were created for group therapy, uh, they're also really important for organizational work, community work, and uh, work within the larger uh, framework of society. That these 11 therapeutic factors can be cultivated within a or agency or an organization and help promote that organization towards the successful uh, fulfillment of whatever their organization mission is, the goals within the organization. And that our work within organizations can also create healing for individuals within organizations. Uh, an organization is essentially just a group. The same thing, same idea goes for communities and societies, in that communities and societies are essentially just larger groups than a therapy group or groups that we might engage with in group work. So uh, if you're part of an organization, and most of us are, I really encourage you to consider how these therapeutic factors show up within your organization. When you think about the various communities and the society that we're all a part of, I encourage you to consider how you might contribute to cultivating these 11 therapeutic factors within your communities and within society as a whole. And when you reflect on these 11 therapeutic factors in terms of group work and group therapy, it could be helpful to consider which of these therapeutic factors do I do a really good job of cultivating naturally in my group work? Which of these therapeutic factors might be important for me to more intentionally focus on in my group? Uh, are there any therapeutic factors that seem to have been missing in the development of the group that I'm leading? In my own experience of participating in groups, which of these therapeutic factors were most important to me? Or which of these therapeutic factors might be most important to the clients, the populations that I'm working with? So I really encourage you to take a couple minutes and reflect on how these 11 therapeutic factors show up within your group work. <music>